Hello ladies and gentlemen, today in War Thunder I'm going to be looking at an issue that I've seen which has been brought up many times when it comes to aircraft, when it comes to ground forces, on the forums and discussion between players and everything like that. And the idea that I'm talking about is one that historical matchmaking should be put in. Now when it comes to aircraft and stuff like that, there are a bunch of factors involved but I think that historical matchmaking could make sense as long as you balance, uh, as long as you balance factions against each other by numbers. So, if I will get into more detail with that probably in another time, but right now I want to focus on ground forces. I want to focus on on some evidence which completely blows this whole idea that historical matchmaking would be a great idea in War Thunder. And obviously, with the recent, uh, well, destruction of simulator battles, unless you want to play an event, in Ground Forces has now made it so realistic battles and arcade battles are the only ways to go. Um, not just Ground Forces, but aircraft as well. There are many factors when it comes to historical matchmaking that I don't think people really talk about or really think of uh, when the idea of historical matchmaking is put in or even thought of or even debated and the fact is just as a conclusion before everything else it would not make sense because the major issues are there were certain tanks which were if perfectly performing would be completely overpowered at when they were introduced into uh, the war, uh, using their first battle as a reference. And the thing is, because these tanks had reliability issues, or there weren't a lot of them, they, weren't, they didn't give that much of an impact. But the thing is, they were still there. So if you uh, base historical matchmaking on when the tank was introduced, or when a tank first saw battle, that does not work because it doesn't take into account many factors. Some of these factors are reliabilities of these vehicles, certain parts, the metal use, which is quite an interesting point to look at, especially when we look at the T-34 tanks. The number of tanks that were actually at the battle, maybe something was introduced, but only two were there. So is that seen as an introduction date? Prototypes being involved in battles and prototypes being in War Thunder um, basically means that if you employed historical matchmaking how the hell does that make sense would you basically have to come up with a date where they were uh, basically involved or, or would have been involved if the prototype comes through or would you just have to disregard them completely and make up a different system for them the fact that when it comes to a lot of tank battles there weren't actually that many in World War 2 because Especially America and Britain saw tanks as a way to um, support infantry. They saw it as an infantry support vehicle. So therefore, there was usually infantry involved. There was usually aircraft involved. There was usually st uh, stationary guns, AA guns, all of this stuff all going on at once. It wasn't just a tank-on-tank -tank battle. Even stuff like the Battle of Kursk, where you did have... Uh, straight on tank on tank battles they didn't last long they weren't massive scale battles and most of the time especially using the battle of Kursk or even uh, the battle of Baston or uh, if you want to call it the battle of the Bulge basically the uh, counter attack of the uh, of, not the Arnhem <laughs> of the of the the counter attack of the German offensive uh, when it basically went through the forest of the Ardennes. There we go, the Ardennes forest. Uh, it, it wasn't just tanks when it came down to it. And it boggles my mind that people don't see these things. Now I'm going to go through some examples now, which I think I'm going to go through each point with these examples to basically show. And I'm going to highlight uh, the basic standards of each of the armies, or at least what people think they were. With the Germans, I'm going to highlight the Panther, uh, mainly the Panther Aus D, the Tiger One, obviously, 
and um, I will talk about Panzer threes and Panzer fours as well because we have to remember that Panzer threes and fours were the mainstay of the German tank army. It was as simple as that because they were used all the way through the war. They were used from 1939 to 1945 because they were a lot easier to produce than these Tigers and Panthers and also they were quite easily upgraded which is something that the Germans kind of needed uh, when their supply lines were definitely stretched across multiple countries. But anyway, first of all looking at the Tiger 1. So the Tiger 1 in its entirety only 1347 were built or 1000 347. Now, basically, I'm using uh, Wikipedia as a reference here. I'll put all the Wikipedia links in. The thing is, um, if people say, look, are you using Wikipedia, yada, 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 I've gone through every single source that is cited for these numbers and for these ideas, and they all link to articles, to books, which have multiple sources on multiple sources, and you can go through all of them, just as I have, and then you can basically be quiet about using Wikipedia as a source. The old uh, university that I used to go to now recognises Wikipedia as a source, because everything on Wikipedia has to be sourced for it to be legitimate. But anyway, getting on to the Tiger one. 1,347 of these were built, produced between 42 and 44. Now, let's compare that to the T-34. All variants of the T-34. 84,000 were made. Nearly 50,000 T-34-85s were made. Comparing it to the Sherman, uh, the M4 Sherman. Nearly 7,000, 6,784. The M4A2, 8,000. So the thing is, the Tiger I, as a mainstay vehicle um, of the German of the German uh, army, doesn't make any sense. There was not a lot of these built compared to the T-34s and the Shermans, which are arguably the mainstay of the Russian and American armies. <clears throat> now you could go into uh, British tanks there, but I'm going to uh, looking at the Cromwell and the Firefly, but I'm going to Focus on the three, uh, the three factions we have in game. So it basically helps you go. Uh, okay, I can see in my head what he's talking about. So the Tiger one, with such a small amount being made, the issue with it is if you put it, um, if you use it in historical matchmaking, the first time this was used was in late 1942, and um, the thing is. In late 1942, how about we look at what the other, the other factions had, the the Allies in a way had. So to start with, you have the T-34, obviously. Uh, the T-34, the ones which were around at that time, if I can just find it. No, it's not that one. Uh, yeah, right. So you had the T-34 model 1942, and then you had the T-34 model 1943. Now, weirdly enough, the 1943 T-34 was actually made and produced in 1942. I have no idea why they called it the 1943. Probably because it was late 1942, but that is the same time that the Tiger One came around. So the T-34 1943 had a 76mm gun. Um, it actually had a longer range than the Tiger, and um, obviously a lot more were produced. Same with the 1942 versions. The issue with it is, if you put one Tiger against one T-34, 10 times out of 10, uh, not taking any other factors apart from firepower and, uh, firepower and armor and everything like that, and rounds and gun, you know, basically the stuff that we have in War Thunder now, the Tiger is going to win 10 times out of 10. Now the only way to actually balance this using historical matchmaking is by numbers. So you look at the T-34 model 1943. Now if I can just find this, if it is down here somewhere. Uh, basically, uh, there were tons of T-34s made compared to the Tigers, especially when it comes to uh, the early parts where only a few Tigers were involved in the Battle um, of Kursk, same with the Panther. But 
the issue is here that we have 35,000 T-34s, which includes a 1941, 1940, L-11, 1942, 1943, the 85, uh, the, uh, the 76. All of these different variants go into the number of 35,000. So let's be generous and cut that by a third. So let's say about 12,000 and 1943s. That still means that with this tiger, you have 1,347 produced, okay? Compared to uh, 13,000 or 12,000. Uh, so you're looking at a ratio of about 10 to 1 uh, being rough. And that's very, very rough. If I wanted to do the calculations, I could. But the thing is, I want it's a rough calculation so you can get a ballpark figure and you can understand. So that would mean for every one tiger in a game, there has to be 10 T-34 1943s or 1942s because that was the time that the tiger was around initially. And it was the time that they were initially around. So with this T-34, it would get stomped on its own against one tiger. But can you imagine going into a realistic game where you're in your tiger and then you look around you and there's nothing on your team then you look on the enemy team and there are 10 T-34s. Now, a lot of people say this is fine because this is how it would have been in real life. But that's just, that is just not what happened. It was not a, it, w it was not a singular tiger taking on the Russian army. It was groups, it was battalions, it was squads of these tanks, of these infantries, either attacking or defending points. And the thing is, when it came down to it, if you concentrate your forces, which the Germans did in the Battle of Kursk, they basically concentrated their forces into three main offensive lines, the numbers advantage isn't that big when it comes down to it. At the end of the battle, it definitely was, because as we can look through literature and everything like that, the Germans knocked out significantly more Russian tanks and Russian infantry and everything like that but because the Russians had the resources to keep bringing stuff in and in and in the Germans had to pull back they did not they could not sustain the offensive and you could argue uh, that they should have defended in the first place but that is not what we're looking at here we're looking at basic facts so you have to think that okay so if all of these tanks met at once, it would be a 10 to 1 ratio. But then, how do you do it? Do, do, you, do you base battles around... Um, do you base battles around tank battles that happened? Do you uh, use the Ardennes Offensive as, an, as basically a point uh, to look at tanks and go, Oh look, there was a squad of Hellcats there, that means that Hellcats should be on this map. There was a few Shermans. Uh, there was a few guns uh, and everything like that, but the majority of the German side is going to be Tigers, Panthers, Tiger Twos, uh, Jag Panzers, and Panzer Fours and Panzer Threes against a very ill-equipped American and uh, Allied forces. But when we look at Kursk, we're looking at the large tank battles, which usually happen on the second or third day. And the thing is, even if we take these into account, the Russians got absolutely smashed. Because they basically tried... Their tactic was to get as close as possible to the Tigers and the Panthers so they could penetrate them with their 85mm, which was seen to... Let's see if I can find this. Uh, which was seen to pen uh, the Tiger... A very close range from 100 meters to 300 meters frontally that is where a tiger could knock it out at 1500 meters so even if you employ all of these things and you go okay so we'll take this battle as a way of looking forward we'll take this battle and go right these are the troops that were on this side these are the troops that were on this side we're gonna set it up like that that still leaves out the majority of tanks that people will be playing because they were not part of that battle. There were a lot of tanks in World War II which were not used extensively 
which are in War Thunder right now, and you cannot just take them out. And they would only be able to fit on certain maps against certain enemies. And therefore, you could be waiting for years for a match to get a historical battle. And that's not even taking into account uh, people who, who learn the maps, who know where people are going to go, and are going to exploit everything. I get, that's another thing entirely. But you're basically talking about increasing queue times 10, 20 fold. Because there is, even though War Thunder has grown a lot, there is still not enough players in this game to have things like that, especially when players are split between aircraft and ground forces. So with the Tiger, if it was introduced in 1942 against these T-34s, the worst outcome for the Tiger is that it's 10 to 1. You would lose every time. It's as simple as that. Uh, it, let's say it's three Tigers against maybe 10 T-34 85s. Then you would have a decent chance. That would actually work. But then again, this is not factoring in everything else. There are so many factors that people forget about. In this case, you're looking at the KV series of tanks. The SU-76s. The ISs. The, just the SUs in general. There were SU-100s and SU-122s present at the Battle of Kursk. There were also IS-2s, I believe. Maybe IS-1s. I could be wrong on that. But I believe there were IS-2s. And the thing is, all these things are not factored in. And then you have to remember their production and when they were produced. And would they be there on that day to fight this? And how many were there? And all of these things, just to get yourself a historical battle. And that is impossible. I don't think people even can understand the amount of effort and work that would have to put in to set this up. For it just to fail because not enough because everybody wants to play a tiger and nobody wants to play a panzer four or a panzer three and everybody wants to play the ISs because the T thirty fours are superior uh, well not superiorly um, are a lot weaker than them against tigers which they know they're going to be fighting. There's a thing in online gaming and it has been present in War Thunder from the start or at least from when I've been playing it which is about a year and a half ago. People will always gravitate to the machines which were best, or are best. At the moment, you look at the Tiger, uh, it's matched up a lot of the time against BR 5.0 Americans who are trying to grind the trees, and it absolutely destroys them. The 76s for the Shermans do well against the Tigers and the Panthers, but the Tigers are still at an advantage just because of their long-range capabilities. And by the way, to let's let's just get sidetracked a bit here. The Sherman 76s, okay? Do you want to know when they were produced, and do you want to know when they were actually used? So the M4A176, um, 3,246 produced, started January 1944. That's about a year and a half after the Tiger was introduced. M4A276, April 1944. That's two years and that's being generous after the Tiger was introduced. Uh, what else do we have? The M4A3s with the 75 and the 76, February 1944, March 1944. These are all two years after the Tiger was introduced, at least. The only things, as an American side, you would be to face the Tiger and the Panther, because as we know, the Panther came around the same time as the uh, Tiger, uh, which is, let's see, uh, it's basically uh, late 1942 to early 1943. I suppose you could make a case about the Panther, but we'll get into that uh, later on. So against these machines, as the Americans, because tank destroyers aren't around yet, remember, you would have the M4A1, which would get decimated, the M4, which is even worse at it. Uh, the M4A2, which would once again get decimated, and the M4A3, which can tank some shots, but that's about it. Um, it can tank some shots, but it can't deal any back unless it's sat right next to it, looking at its arse end, looking uh, to hit the engine. 
the M4A4, I suppose, uh, you can throw into that, uh, Ju July 1942. All of these machines are completely inferior to the Tiger when it comes to looking at their firepower and when it comes to looking at their armor. In other ways, they were a lot better, but unfortunately, with the current game mechanics, they do not take these into account. So, if we even, if we look at game mechanics, right, there are certain things, if you add in a historical matchmaking system, you have to add in historical performance for tanks. Um, the fact that, let's see if I can find the quote. Here we go. So this was on the T-34. Um, there was a lot of testing done at Aberdeen in America. The, basically, the Russians sent over uh, some, uh, some tanks to be tested by the Americans. And this is what they said. Judging by samples, Russians, when producing tanks, pay little attention to careful machining or the finishing and technology of small parts and components, which leads to the loss of the advantage what would otherwise accrue from what, on the whole, are well-designed tanks. Despite the advantages of the use of diesel, the good contours of the tank's thick armour, good and reliable armaments, the successful design of the tracks, etc., Russian tanks are significantly inferior to American tanks in their simplicity of driving, maneuverability, the strength of firing, reference to muzzle velocity, speed, the reliability of mechanical construction, and the ease of keeping them running. Now, it is not, I don't believe, an unpopular opinion to basically say that the T-34 was designed to be basically a throwaway tank. It was designed um, to attack the enemy and be quite good at it but it was not designed to last it was basically designed on the fact that if you can engage an enemy and kill them then you can look at your losses and even if they are worse than the enemies because you have such a superior number you can always replace the tanks and sometimes replace the crew as well that's how they were designed you can see that and because of the constraints that the Russians had during production of all these things, there was a lot of issues with uh, natural resources when it came to, well, at least the early war period in Russia. Uh, they struggled. It's, it's even documented when you look at the IL-2s. A lot of the cannons which were produced for uh, Russian planes were basically reserved for IL-2s, the 20mm and the 23s, and if they could get their hands on 23s, they would put them on IL-2s, but that did not happen all the time. Now, when it comes to Russian tanks, it was seen that the metals we used were not of good grade. It basically meant that it doesn't matter looking at statistics of thickness of armour or, um, or basically the caliber of gun or anything like that because because the grade of metal was so bad um it was even shown that t-34s or at least the 1941 and 42 models could be pierced by small caliber um guns such as 37s and mortar rounds which we definitely don't see in game uh, especially through the front and these are factors that are not taken into account. Um, the fact that the reliability of the machines is really not even looked at. The Panthers, when they were first in introduced in late 1942, early 1943, had massive issues. Absolutely massive. So this is what, um, basically, on the 17th of July 1943, uh, Hitler ordered a stop to the German offensive at Kursk because, well, it, it, it wasn't working. He was losing too many things. He did not have enough uh, reserves to sustain everything. All the reserves were in. So this is what General Heinz Guderian, who a lot of people should know, uh, sent um, as a preliminary assessment of the Panthers. Remember that 200 Panthers were sent... Um, were basically sent to uh, the Battle of Kursk as an initial idea. Um, uh, so this is what he said. Due to enemy action and mechanical breakdowns, the combat strength sank rapidly during the first few days. By the evening of the 10th of July, there were only 10 operational Panthers in the front line, 
25 Panthers had been lost as total write-offs. 23 were hit and burnt and two had caught fire during the approach march. 100 Panthers were in need of repair. 56 were damaged by hits and mines and 44 by mechanical breakdowns. 60% of the mechanical breakdowns could be easily repaired. Approximately 40 Panthers had already been repaired and were on the way to the front. About 25 still had not been recovered by the repair service. On the evening of the 11th of July, 38 Panthers were operational. 31 were total write-offs and 131 were in need of repair. A slow increase in the combat strength is observable. The large number of losses by hits, 81 Panthers up to the 10th of July, attest to the heavy fighting. So, out of 200 um, rebuilt Panthers, after the initial complete waste uh, that they were at the start, 131 of them were in need of repair after a few days. And it, it's not as if there were heavy fighting or anything. Uh, basically, when it comes to a need of repair, as shown, 44 of them uh, were by mechanical breakdown, others were because of hits or mines. So 44, 44 uh, were down to mechanical breakdown. Uh, at the start of this, there were 200 rebuilt Panthers. Uh, from the first assault, 184 were operational, so we'll take that number. So, 184 were operational, 44 of them went down to mechanical breakdown. Nothing to even do with fighting. That's about, what, about a quarter of your fighting force. And you're telling me that, because these were introduced at that time, they should face stuff like T-34 1943s and T-34 85s and stuff like that. Not the T-34 85 in its current state, but the one that should be in. Where if we are looking at realistic standards and the grade of metal instead of the impenetrable fortress that the turret of the T-34 85 is. So, basically, in two days, the Panther had gone down from 184 operational Panthers to 40 because of various different reasons mainly down to mechanical uh, malfunctions mainly down to the fact that they were shot at weirdly enough um, since it was an offensive so that's what Heinz Guderian said he's he was obviously displeased about it if you read on you can see how he basically says it's a failure without saying it's a failure obviously he cannot tell Hitler that it was a failure because Hitler had put a lot of stock into these tanks and he thought that the Panthers, the Tigers, uh, the Elephants, stuff like that will be able to push through and will give him the edge but that just really wasn't the case at the end of the day. Now this brings up another interesting point maybe instead of doing it by introduction date which, com which showed here and with the Tiger and with the early T-34s makes no sense at all because they had so many issues upon release, even with the Elephant for God's sake and the Ferdinand. Um, even on release they had so many issues that you cannot class that as a good or a decent introduction. It would be better to maybe say, right, so they actually figured out all of the issues with this tank uh, let's say in 1944 and that's when it should be and that's when it should be supposedly introduced into the matchmaking I would be completely fine with that but by doing that you are guessing because well looking at the Panthers you have so many different variants of it even now we have two different Tigers I believe there are three different Panthers uh, not including the you know the massive one at the end I think that would be four or f four different Panthers and the thing is, each panther gets better as you go along. But the thing is, you get better as you go along, but you do not... And it, and the, basically the game does not take into account the, uh, the issues that each variant had. Instead of having strengths and weaknesses to these tanks, basically the amount of strength that a tank has increases as it goes along the line instead of uh, counting in the weaknesses and if you're looking to do historical matchmaking you have to add stuff like this in uh, 
to be historically accurate, otherwise it will not be able to balance. Because <laughs> if you have all of these panthers and tigers running around without any engine issues, without any suspension issues, without um, without the fact that they would just break down randomly, uh, with all uh, even with all the fuel leaking and everything like that, then what they're just going to run rampant against basically everything they face. So that really isn't going to work. You have that. That's just one of the factors, which is the reliability of the vehicles. I've talked slightly about the number of tanks on each side. Obviously that is a big issue. Uh, the amount of Panthers that were made was, I believe, was it 6,000? Uh, yeah, about 6,000. So, uh, even to that ilk, you're not even looking at a one-to-one -one ratio. Taking all the T-34 85s, which is probably what they would face around that time, you're looking at 29,430. So, if we uh, take the Panther at 6,000, the T-34 at 30,000, you were looking at a 5 to 1 ratio. And even though that's better than the Tiger, I still don't think that is fair at all. Um, because uh, the T-34 85s can quite easily deal with a Panther, actually. Or at least in my experience they can, apart from long ranges, and that's where the Panther wins. But having a 5 to 1 ratio, the T-34s would run over the Panthers. And once again, this is not including the KVs, the ISs, the SUs, everything else which will be around. This is just taking one, one of the main components of the army which will, uh, which will be there. So I've talked about prototypes. Uh, some, another thing is obviously fuel consumption. A lot of these maps aren't very large. Uh, which completely makes sense, but I like how Men of War does it, uh, and have have been doing even since Faces of War, which came out a hell of a long time ago. This idea that your vehicles have a certain amount of fuel, and I think to balance gameplay in a way, that could be done. I believe that having having a certain amount of fuel on each vehicle is a way you could balance this to make it a bit more historically viable. There were certain tanks which had longer ranges, therefore they should have more fuel. Uh, this may encourage camping, I suppose, uh, because there'll be certain tanks which don't have a lot of fuel. I mean, uh, you look at something like the Tiger, the Tiger's operational distance was really not that big because of that gas guzzling engine. It was its operational range was about 68 to 121 miles, uh, so 110 to 195 kilometers. So really not that far at all. When you look at something like the T-34, uh, you're looking at something like 150 mile or 240 kilometers, and that's at cruising speed. So you're looking at 30 more miles than the German counterpart. Looking at the Panther, let's see if I can find this. Uh, do, do, do. Operational range 160 miles, so you give that a bit more fuel than the T-34. You make bases a fuel point, because um, the way that tank battles were, and the way that any battles were, you have your front line, you have your mid line, which is either your reserves, your artillery, your support, basically, and then you have the back line, which is... Uh, I suppose if you have extra reserves, extra reserves, but it's also stuff like fuel, it is stuff like ammunition, it is basically st places to restock, because obviously those places, those people and those places do not want to be near the fight at all. So, making that a factor could add into this whole, it could make this historical matchmaking uh, malarkey a bit more reasonable, but that will never happen because the maps are not big enough. If you do it by scale, then you're just going to get people who have run out of fuel in the middle of nowhere, which I'll be completely fine with, but they'll just bitch for the rest of the match because they are stuck um, in the middle of a bloody field. Maybe you could have it so you can press U, and depending on how far you are away from the base, that's how long it takes them to refuel you. I think that would be cool. Uh, you could even have people in supply trucks who do that for you, like actual players, but that's getting a bit technical <laughs> when it comes down to it. But 
all of these are factors that I don't think people really look into. They don't look into uh, they don't look into the numbers that were actually made, their reliability, which is a massive thing. The amount that was actually made at the time and not just overall. Uh, Kursk had around 200, as, as, as said, 200 rebuilt Panthers. It had even less Tigers. But people seem to think that when the Tiger was introduced, that means that all the Tigers were built at the same time. And therefore there was 1,300 uh, Tigers at Kursk. This is just not the case at all. They were made over a, you know, they were made over a period of time. Something else that has to be considered is the fact that overall, with um, with the, the Germans and their engineering standards, they were produced at a very high level. That is no doubt. The issue was, because they were produced at such a high level, it was very, very hard to repair the damn things when they broke. Because basically it's like a clock if you take out one cog everything else falls apart and it's very hard when you're on the battlefield to actually put it back together with a t-34 they were seen as expendable which basically meant that if you lost a t-34 don't worry brother get in another let's see who's left in your crew okay you've got a driver and a machine gunner you'll need a gunner and, uh, and a loader or just a gunner because uh, most of the time there's only two people in the turret uh, so you do stuff like that uh, when it actually came down to it in World War Two, and that will never be taken into account because it, it is so technical. And for doing doing that for every single goddamn tank, you would not be able to do it. They try and do it by having heavy tanks only having one speed, one respawn, and medium tanks having two. But as shown here, the <laughs> the um, Panther was actually kind of hard to fix, especially when it was new to all the mechanics in mid-1943. So I'm really confused when people say that that won't be a factor or anything like that. But one of the biggest things that completely just destroys this idea for me, and remember this is all my opinion, but it's the idea that um, basically... There weren't many tank battles in World War II, or at least straight tank on tank. Most battles fought were either tanks supporting infantry, or uh, infantry moving in, tanks in the back, artillery behind that, you have your bombardment beforehand, all of this stuff, it is all planned. It is never just a tank on tank battle. I believe it, well, I'm not even going to speculate. There were not a lot of tank battles. And ones which were around were either in Africa, there were a few in Russia. There really were, but they weren't. They were either slaughters either way. <laughs> uh, you had a few in Normandy, I suppose, but most of them which are documented document basically a single tank taking on a battalion or a few tanks taking on a hell of a lot of more a hell of a lot more tanks. So, they're not just out-and-out -out tank battles. There is also infantry involved in them. There are aircraft involved. There are all these things. And even though aircraft is involved in a minor way, it, it's not how it works historically. And if you tried to do it historically, then aircraft would just... They wouldn't. You would never get a person in a tank because you would just have aircraft dominating the map. Because... It is rough to say, um, but it is true. An aircraft will always beat a tank uh, nine times out of ten because one of those times the tank will get a lucky shot or something. That's why AA vehicles were even introduced. Another thing that I think a lot of people forget is that a lot of the tanks in game, especially the American lines, uh, the American line, sorry, it was designed to uh, support infantry. The M4 Sherman was seen as an infantry support tank. That's why it had so many different variations to basically cover the different uh, the different ways you would assault a target or defend one. That's why the 105 was introduced to basically be a bunker buster. And there was the same idea behind stuff like the KV-1 and the KV-2. They were heavy support tanks for infantry. They were not really designed to take on uh, these... Uh, what was seen as colossal German tanks, even though they weren't, that was the T-34's job. Which is why the majority of the time, especially in Shermans, 
the ammo count, most of it was high explosive. And then you'd have armor piercing and then sometimes APCR or APBC. Um, and, but you would have a hell of a lot more HE because you were dealing with infantry more often than you were dealing with tanks. Because when you look at infantry, you can't just look at infantry. You've got to think of tank destroyers, which is something that the Americans really need right now. They need the Hellcats, the Wolverine, the Slugger, all of those things just to even make it balance. But anyway, you have got to remember stationary guns, anti-tank guns, uh, basically stuff like that, stuff like the 88s used, uh, the Pack 36s, the Pack 38s, the, even the Pack bloody 40s, stuff like that. The Bofors, if you want to bloody throw that in. Um, the 17 pounders, all of these guns which were basically used as anti-tank guns which are not represented in the game because they are basically part of the infantry part. <laughs> yes you have a few maps which have them dotted here and there but if you wanted a true historical experience there would be them everywhere especially in the town maps. You would not be able to go down the streets without getting shot by one because that's what they were designed to do. They were designed to cover small areas of land. It's not as if um, uh, like a gun crew would run around trying to chase a tank, shoot it and then try and run off again. No, they were basically used um, in camouflage places, uh, in places like falling down buildings and stuff to cover them so they could always get the first shot off. So if stuff like that was introduced you would get a hell of a lot of pissed off tankers who would basically be trying to who would be saying, why are these guys always killing me? They are AI, or they are, you know, you. I suppose you could, could make them human players, but that would just even make it worse. They, nobody would once again play tanks, because in effect you would be at an unfair advantage, because first of all you'd have all the tank destroyers trying to kill you, and then you would have all of these stationary guns trying to kill you, uh, or self-propelled guns, uh, such as howitzers and artillery, like, stuff like the Priest, if you want to get into it. Or the Hummel, uh, looking at the Axis side. Um, but you'd have all these things which are designed to kill tanks. And you would get massacred. Because they were all designed to kill tanks. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know how else to say it uh, without sounding very crude. But when it comes to historically, there were a hell of a lot of things in World War II which were completely designed to take out tanks. That's why tank destroyers is even a word. That's why the Jagdpanzer exists, the Stug 3, um, not really the SU-1-2, the 152, they were more howitzer based. Uh, the SU-85 is a good example, and the 80 85M, stuff like that. Um, the SU-100, the Wolverine, Hellcat. Uh, even the bloody tortoise, if you want to get into it. But all of these things were designed to kill tanks, and that's not including the stationary guns, that's not including the infantry, which had obviously anti-tank grenades. Uh, if you ever want to look up something interesting, look up plastic explosives. They were pretty cool. Um, but there are all these factors that cannot be taken into account uh, in the game. And if you aren't going to create a completely historical game, uh, you cannot have historical matchmaking because it will either sway one way or the other uh, when it comes to uh, stuff, when it comes to like fuel, when it comes to uh, the numbers. I think the numbers is the big one. But the thing is, at the end of the day, it will always come down to armor and how good your gun is. <clears throat> in the battles right now. And I think that has to be changed. I think there has to be a few more factors. I would be fine having like stuff like 10 T-34s or 10 Shermans against uh, 5 Tigers. But we cannot go to the extreme lengths that if we look at historically, it would have been like. We cannot do that because it will destroy the game for basically everyone. And I haven't even talked about Tiger 2s, but... Basically, Tiger 2s would be in a worse position than Tiger 1s at the end of the day. But there, there are just a hell of a lot of factors. I should, I should even do a video of just looking at, you know, 
just listing all the factors I can think of of why this is a bad idea. And there will basically just be realistic situations which cannot be simulated in a game. War Thunder is a brilliant simulator when it comes to World War II. It is probably, in my opinion, one of the best out there. I've had a lot of fun in this, and I will continue to have a lot of fun in this. But I do not think that historical matchmaking is even a goal that can be achieved. If you want that, you can always set up a custom battle, or you can play events, or, you know, there are options out there if you want a fully historical battle. There was a group in World of Tanks that I used to watch and I used to enjoy, where basically they would set up historical matches um, against each other, like they would basically uh, do clan stuff. And that's how they would reenact historical battles. Why can't we do that in War Thunder instead of changing the whole system for everybody because of a few people saying that it would be good without, with basically being misinformed with all of this stuff? It does my head in when a minority tries to control everything. But that's, that's a complete different point altogether. Basically, in conclusion... Historical matchmaking will never work. There are too many factors to be considered, and they will never all be considered. It, I, I can't say more plainly than that. So cheers, and I'll catch you next time.